And the first speaker I would like to introduce is going to talk about robust software and centric IoT. His name is Kasper Verdik Lund, and he uh, comes from Toyware. Welcome, Kasper. Can you all hear me? Yep. That is perfect. I only have 15 minutes, uh, so I'll try to be brief, but still uh, give you a, a sense of what we were building down at the, at the Harvard Hearing Office. So um, I've been uh, doing software platform for too long. Uh, software platforms are really abstraction layers uh, that run other software on top, and uh, probably the, the most uh, well-known piece of software that I have my, my hand in is something I did with, uh, with uh, Google for a while. Uh, how many of you are familiar with that logo? It's a well-known thing. Google Chrome. So we took a, a browser and we uh, we turned it into an application platform by making the, the software foundation for running applications on top much, much more robust and much, much faster, like a hundred times faster than uh, what it was before we started. And it really changed how you could program and use the web browser as an application delivery platform. I'm not here to talk about JavaScript or Chrome. I'm here to talk about that tiger there. So Toyware is a um, it's a small startup company, started uh, a bit more than a year ago. We're now eight engineers uh, working on uh, sort of the next generation software platforms for our team. I'm going to tell you all about what that is and hopefully also a little bit about why that is. So Toyware is working in this space. This is a sort of an example of a kind of device that we could target. Lots of wires, lots of chips, lots of things in there. How many of you feel comfortable writing software for things like this? 20%. That's actually a pretty high number. In general, what we see is that very few people actually feel comfortable writing software for these things. It's hard, it's difficult, and it seems complicated for some reason. So usually, the kind of device that we look at here are actually sort of growing up. They're getting to be what I would call like proper uh, uh, computers in a sense. They're network connected, a bit too small to run Linux or Windows or Mac OS, but they actually support all the modern communication standards now, so you can actually have them engage in a proper uh, dialogue with other network devices and have the right encryption and everything turned on. doesn't have hardware support for address isolation, which makes it hard to run things like Linux on top. So usually people run a more primitive uh, real-time operating system on these devices. They are quite powerful though. Here's an example of one. ESP32 comes with a half a megabyte of RAM, 4 megabytes of flash, and it costs around two dollars. Even if you don't buy too many of them, you can go to uh, AliExpress and just order them. They're cheap and they're really good. Um, so these devices are really fast. I mean, if you look at how fast they can execute code, um, they're like dual core, 240 megahertz uh, CPUs, much faster than the sort of the desktop machines that we used uh, like 15 or 20 years ago. So all that for less than two dollars. It's quite impressive. What's less impressive is the kind of tools that you usually use to develop code for these things. So I, the, the really tried and trusted tools in this, in this area is a C compiler. Uh, that's the logo for the GNU compiler collection, which has a C compiler that's heavily used here, and a soldering iron. It's not super uh, sort of high tech, but it works and it's really what people use today. So what they do when they then develop is they, they find some chip like this and they start with that basically. Find the hardware, what do we need? How fast should it be? How much RAM do we need? And you go buy it. And then you find a, a real-time OS, and you, you decide which one you, you like. Like free Atas would be a good example of that, and there are others too. Um, so you, ch you choose that. Then you write all your stuff. And once you're happy with that, you link it together with your, your OS. Um, you transfer that whole thing uh, to the image, to, uh, as an image to the device. And um, you reboot it. And with any luck, it comes to life, and it does everything you want it. So there's probably a little bit of praying involved here as well. So there are a lot of things really, really sort of wrong with this picture in, in, in terms of how you do this, but this is really how it's done today. So my least favorite part of this is probably this whole system image part, that all the code on this device that does something for you is put together in one blob and tra transferred as a whole to this device. That's a real issue. I mean, nobody would ever do that on a big server system, say, okay, we'll write all the code in one blob, compile and link it all together, and ship it as the only thing for an entire machine, and trust that everything works. That's not a, a modern way of doing things. We'd like to break it down a bit more. So for me, that's the, that's the worst thing here. And in general, there's not a whole lot to like about this, I think. So I think this is sort of usually how I think of IoT development today. Um, 
there's a lot of crying involved, a lot of pain. Some people are still actually developing really fantastic things with this stack, but it's not pleasant. So I think the reason why you really cry is because like, the device you have and the way you use it, it doesn't really give you a way to update the, the code. It doesn't give you a way to run really sophisticated software on this, this thing, even though the device actually can support this. You just don't do it. It's not really a generic and flexible solution you have. It's often tied to an, uh, an application that you had in mind when you bought the device. And it's not a secure and sandboxed environment for code you don't necessarily trust. Everything is compiled together, has the same privileges. So if there's an application problem in, in one part of your code, it takes down the entire thing. It's not a super nice model to work in. And so building on that, it's not a fault-tolerant uh, system uh, as, as, a, uh, as a starting point. So working in this space, writing software in this space, is just not super pleasant and hard. And I think there are two sort of common th things here. It's very hardware-centric. That's what you buy. That's what you focus on. Um, and it's also built on a fairly poor foundation, I think. So, and I don't know how many of you are familiar with building on poor foundations. It does happen out in the real world too, not just in software. It usually looks something like this. Um, it's, not, it's not a good idea to build on a poor foundation. I, in, in reality, the best thing you can have is have a really solid foundation and build fancy, interesting, weird things on top, and maybe they'll still fall apart, but at least you have a, a common ground that actually works across these things. So this is the space we work in. Um, not quite sure why I ended up adding our logo there. Um, it's not that we're trying to put more tigers on beaches, but we're actually trying to solve this by giving things a much better foundation and uh, improving things in that space. So let me give you a peek for our solution in this space. This is actually it. It's very, very simple. At the core of it, we've changed pretty much nothing. We have like a real-time OS, in this case, free ATAS. We have a, a, a TCP IP stack that we didn't invent, lightweight IP. And we pick uh, sort of standard components for TLS, uh, encrypted uh, communication, like embed TLS. But where the magic happens is really on top of that. We, we glue in a, a, a software abstraction layer, a virtual machine, if you will. Um, we call it Toit, and maybe you'll get an answer to why we call it that in a moment. Um, but that, that's what we glue in, and this is sort of the, the technology space we've been working in for a while. And um, JavaScript in a browser runs a virtual machine. Uh, Java on a server runs a virtual machine. It's time for IoT devices to also run a virtual machine. So we built that. Uh, on top, we actually run some, some system services. And this is where we, we hook up this system to the, to the broader internet. So everything that communicates with this device goes through a managed uh, set of uh, services uh, that runs on this virtualized uh, machine. This gives us some advantages in, in terms of uh, platform independence. So if you have a virtual machine, you can easily move this and, and replace the, the bottom layer here, uh, the darkest colored one, to, to be a, a Linux machine instead if you want to run it there or pick another OS. You have this sort of built-in platform independence. Um, that means you can test your IoT code, um, not on a device, but somewhere else, and you get a chance to actually start with software functionality even before you buy a device and, and start sort of messing with that and figuring out how that should work. What's sort of left here is actually, I think, where, where the pretty clever thing comes, comes to life is that this model allows you to have independent applications running on top that can be versioned independently, updated independently, written independently, they're just like you would have on a proper operating system, if you will, support for having these isolated components, piece of functionality that runs um, separate from each other and still uses the same foundation. So this is sort of what we're building, a, a IoT platform that gives you robustness at the core, but also gives you the ability to actually run software components that you didn't think of when you shipped your device, software components that need to be upgraded uh, and, and sent out. Um, sort of in a more fluid way. So this is much closer to what you have on a desktop machine that runs Linux or in a server uh, data center where you also have lots of applications that get updated independently and, and sent out that way. We still have time, that's good. So the virtual machine itself is a, is, is a software abstraction that builds um, on top of this fairly simplistic hardware and gives you essentially a new kind of machine. It's higher level. Uh, it gives you the ability to actually have programs that are more compact because they're represented in, in a byte-coded format and not native code for some particular platform. But this independence allows you to upload one application written in a high-level language and get it across a number of different devices, even if they don't share the same kind of CPU. There's nothing super novel about this approach uh, in general. Like we have seen Java bytecode uh, 
conquer a good chunk of the world for many, many years. It's just kind of new to, I think, push this to these fairly small devices. So I'm going to give you a sneak peek for how it is to work with our, uh, our system. So if you wanted to write some code for a, a particular device, you'd probably start out with a command line here and say, tell me which device I have available. In this case, it just prints a really, really long and annoying UUID for the device. We're working on adding some aliases for these things so you can name things in a more clean way. But for now, this is a unique name for a device. Once you have your devices here, connected through Wi-Fi or narrowband IoT or even LoRa and things like that, you can actually start communicating with it and, and ask it to do things for you just like you can on the computer you're sitting in front of. So for instance, here I can say toy run, give that long, long device ID, and ask it to ho run hello world on the device. So this is me uh, sort of writing code here in front of you on a slide that runs on my development machine, but actually executes things on a small network connected device instead. So the middle part here is really uh, just shows you like, what happens when you do this. It, uh, it starts up a brand new process on the device with code that, that that device had never seen before, gets that all compiled together as a small, completely separate component. We uh, put it over there, store it in flash so it doesn't take up too much RAM, and we run it. And once we're done, we just stop that whole thing, remove the code, and, uh, and off you go. Of course, you can have long-running services on there, uh, there as well that you can upgrade, but this ability to just try things out without breaking down the entire platform if you get it wrong uh, is a really nice, nice thing. So even if you um, might put bugs in your, in your code, and I think most of us probably will at some point, uh, it doesn't take down the system at all. At the very low end of uh, the slide, at the bottom here, you see like, the smallest kind of toy program, in this case, Hello World, and it's uh, indentation-based. I would say Python had a weird stepson with Java or something um, uh, language. We're still working on how it should work to actually be super familiar and uh, applicable, but it has the right uh, properties that it's, it's easy to, uh, to write high-level code in it, even when it comes to like, network communication and things like that. So this is all the code you're going to see in this presentation. But and now I think it's time to actually to smile and, uh, and be happy, because now you actually have a device. Well, you had the, maybe had the device before too, but now uh, there's reason to be happy, because your device is now updatable and can run high-level code that you, you can write. It's generic and flexible. Um, it's not really tied to a particular application. Even the platform allows your code to run on your Linux machine, in your data center, or on this device. Maybe most importantly, it's this secure sandbox environment for code you do not trust doesn't have to be linked with the kernel, doesn't have to have the same privileges as the kernel code to actually run on this. And this gives fault tolerancy and the ability to upload stuff that you, you didn't think of when you shipped the device. This is a robust foundation, and it's much more software-centric. It's much more software-first. You don't even have to have the hardware to get going with this. And we think this is sort of the future for uh, IoT development in, in, a, in a space where the devices are big enough to support this, which generally mean like 32-bit CPUs and, and upwards. So we're not trying to target very, very small 8-bit, 16-bit microcontrollers. But these are cheap, and they're available, and, uh, and you could all build interesting stuff with a device like this with the proper platform in there. So the technology, in a nutshell, is take whatever small, simple system that was there, uh, hardware, real-time OS, built on top, provide a software platform that allows you to add new devices and get them hooked up in a, in a safe way with the right uh, certificates uh, to do encrypted communication. Secure and reliable over-the-air updates of the entire system software, including the virtual machine, uh, but more importantly, perhaps, software components, applications that are updatable and sandboxed individually. And as a, as sort of a, a teaser at the end, we're also building support for actually writing software that is distributed in nature that runs across maybe 10 or 100 of these small devices. And it's used for computing things, but also for controlling processes. You could also say that it's just a new virtual machine, a programming language, and some management tooling for the Internet of Things. Or perhaps we're just building another app store, in this case, for your appliances, not your, your phones. That's what I had. Thanks a lot.